at a time when so many of our creative spirits, or at least they seem to be creative spirits, sing of man's impotence. One of the most original spirits of our time, Buckminster Fuller, our Buckminster Fuller, sings of man's potency. I, I think uh, everyone aware of his work, and his work has so many facets to it, agrees that Buckminster Fuller is one of the original minds of our time. Bucky Fuller, once upon a time you were called strange, far out. Today you are accepted as seeing tomorrow the way other men look at yesterday. You're still as optimistic as you were the last time we met about prospects for humanity? I'm more so because the reasons for my being optimistic before were not entirely mystical, but were predicated on observation of certain fundamental patterns, such as the fact that the human beings don't really know how to make a baby. And this beautiful, extraordinary piece of design we call the new life just emerges from the womb. And, and as much as I know the parents don't really know what it's about, they talk about what college they're going to send it to and so forth. <laughs> and life is very successful despite man's great ignorance. So that uh, I, I've been observing those kind of patterns of life in gestation as the new life is in the womb. I see that really the whole of mankind seems to be in a state of gestation. I've, I have a strong feeling from the, all the trends that I read that man is about to emerge into so completely a new relationship with the universe that the older generations will be uh, very, uh, very ill-prepared for this extraordinary new relationship of total humanity, uh, which we, I, I see coming on by virtue of our developing our extraordinary awareness of the behavioral uh, characteristics of life. We just begin to know that, that the new young life has <coughs> very much greater capacity to learn than men had ever known before, that the, really all the education is through at seven years old by the time we send them to something called school. And that we are now getting ready to turn that seven that pre-seven year into its really high potential, which means then there is a younger generation coming through to an entirely new relationship to the universe, which uh, we, uh, older generation, are going to have a hard time to understand, which they will understand. We're already getting just even a little break. It's a tiny little break, but in the bringing in, for instance, something called the new mathematics at school, you suddenly find the parents used to enjoy so much helping the children with their mathematics, suddenly finding themselves un unable to help their children with what they're learning. The children are, are moving through into entirely new uh, competence and, and so I say that this is the beginning of a birth of a new relationship to, to universe because that new life, if it really is allowed to develop within its highest potential, its way of looking at the universe will be so different <laughs> as to not look at all the way our newspapers talk of life today. As you're talking, is that a sonic boom we're hearing? I'm just curious. It seemed to be a sonic boom we're hearing, very poetic, I thought. There's quite a counterpart. I, I, I felt that there were a couple of sonic booms. I, I thought that to have sonic booms over Chicago today, as I'm talking here, it's... 1965, and I recall in uh, 1927 in, in Chicago when I first started doing the work that I am doing, wheeling my little child in her baby carriage in Lincoln Park. And I was amazed because a little biplane went over Lincoln Park. Airplanes were not very common in those days. Just to remind ourselves of how uncommon it was that same year that Lindbergh flew his airplane across the Atlantic. For when I saw that little airplane in the sky, <laughs> and it was a very strange sight, I, I said, isn't it amazing? Here's my child looking up at that airplane, and she has just, she's just been born. So that, that, that airplane in the sky is as natural to her as a bird, because when I was born, the airplane did not exist. In fact, I was nine years old when the airplane was invented. So I said, I see this is a very different kind of environment with an airplane in, as normal in your sky. Because it, it was really the, sort of the beginning of uh, impossible sense things happening, where the older generation said that you can't possibly fly and you can't talk by air, but suddenly there was the radio, which came in my day too. Now then, my daughter, who was, I was wheeling the baby carriage, who had an airplane as normal in her sky, uh, now has her daughter, and her daughter was born 11 years ago. And that daughter was born in New York, and they took her to an apartment in the northern end of New York. And it was right in the flight path 
for the Western Continental Bound flights out of LaGuardia and Idlewild. And the planes were going overhead at rate almost for a minute. And this little child then, in her crib, <laughs> would hear this, this airplane go, and people say, airplane. She had that experience so many times that instead of having her first word, mummy or daddy, which most children have, or some of the, the first word she ever mouthed was air. It happened that she was born in the fall, late November, and the leaves were off the trees outside the house. So she saw many thousands of airplanes before she ever saw a bird. I saw the children's books that were sent to her, which were the same kind of children's books that you get in any bookstore. It's a tradition of what a children's book would be. And the same children's books that were sent to me when I was a child. So they were farmyard. There was the barn and all the nice natural things that a child would see, the horse and the pig and the cow and the goat, sheep, rooster. Um, and my daughter, and my granddaughter, <laughs> in New York City, uh, looked out the window and saw those airplanes, and she saw the automobiles going by by the millions. But when they gave her this this farm book, she'd never seen a sheep or a cow or thing, and as if, as if you gave her these imaginary pictures of dragons and things. And she was very accommodated, right? She laughed about the very music. <laughs> but they weren't natural to her. Doesn't this raise a, a challenging question, Bucky? Uh, say a 20th century Audubon would ask, isn't there not a danger of the sound or whir of the plane drowning out the song of the nightingale? Uh, it's a poetic statement, Stad, and, and, and I also f feel it's a poignant statement, and I know that I've come to wonder where the sound of those birds are, but I find when I get into the deep country, the birds go on. They, they, birds know something the first place they fly over, they can see things the way we see it from an airplane now, and they can see the patterns very beautifully. I think one of the most amazing things is the way the, the ducks and the geese learn where the safeguards have been put up for them by man, so that they know the, the refuges, they fly right to them. And the same way the birds are now getting, they're flying around, but they're, they're picking other places, so we just have to go fairly deep in the country to find them. Anyway, I'm also confident about uh, the great big processes of nature, and there are patterns that come and go, and there was a time, you might say, isn't it sad because we don't have the, the wonderful uh, growling of the dinosaurs. It must have been very poetically beautiful sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not uh, bothered at all by the, nature's own uh, due process, because I, 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 we didn't invent the bird, and we didn't invent the man, and I see that these things are moving along some very extraordinary evolution. The word process, you know, uses, I know this is a key word, not only in your vocabulary, in your life, isn't it? You, you think of man as, what, an evolutionary process. Man isn't is, it? is a, a entirely process. He is not a thing. There's a great tendency to think of ourselves like the mannequins in the store windows as China dolls, but we are anything but. And we are, remember, just remember, we are born and conceived at approximately no weight at all. Then we weigh in at seven pounds. And we say, everybody say, oh, look, look at that child. That's just a spitting image of Aunt Mary and Uncle Joe. And so this, sure enough, there is a pattern. He seems to smile the same way, right eyes cocked a little. And so that same child goes to, gets from seven pounds to 70. So we got to used to then looking at 170 pounder <laughs> with the same patterns as, as sort of the China doll. And, and we see him around quite a lot, so we begin to misinterpret uh, this extraordinary phenomenon that is there. But that same man can lose from 170, he can go back to, to 100. <laughs> and he's just the same man, so what is there is not the thingness or the pounds or the potatoes he ate, <laughs> but an extraordinary pattern and integrity, which was the fact that you could see a little Aunt Mary and so forth and the twinkle in the eye of that child. And so I, I myself, uh, deeply impressed then with the continual process of the, I think we uh, eat, uh, we take on somewhere around seven tons of food each, and uh, we breathe enormous amounts, uh, enormous tons of water, and that's not us. Uh, we are the capability to associate those extraordinary pattern principles, which are the chemical elements, and somehow rather to employ that integrating uh, process to do something called communication. And what you're doing with me, you're uh, of saying something to me and getting me to talk about patterns, you're talking about patterns, is in the end by far the most important part of all this. And so in that process we do regenerate and so 
So there's an extraordinary part of the invention to have to have the baby factory here and the, <laughs> the baby factory manager there and they get together and make baby. Well, assume then that the new generation coming up, much more advanced and knowing so much more than uh, those preceding it, assume then that no nut pushes a button. This world you see, there's so many things to ask you, Bucky, that you have foreseen. Roofed cities? Uh, we're continually doing more with less, and my geodesic domes do a very great deal with very little. But I think they're only symptomatic studs, and I wouldn't be surprised if we found ways to control that environment over the city without even seeing the roof there, that, that would be an electrical field control and so forth, and so we could, we could make the water go and dump over here and pipe it there and so forth, whatever it may be. Uh, perhaps one last, I know uh, one of your talks as you travel through various cities is the prospect for humanity. And you paint uh, uh, a prospect that is affirmative in contrast to so many prospects painted by others. And uh, one of your talks was reprinted in the Saturday Review, the 40th anniversary issue opens, the scriptures were right, the meek have inherited the earth, but they do not know it. You still believe this? Yes, yes I'm, I'm convinced that uh, that is correct, uh, very much so. And I feel that the... Uh, for the moment, the uh, trustees of the will, <laughs> the lawyers and sense the managers, uh, politicians, the corporation managers, don't as yet really know quite how to handle this. They've never had such a big will to handle, so they're a little mildly confused. They haven't uh, gotten to completely probate it. And once they probate that thing, then we're going to see man on earth a real success.